Bibles, please open up to Psalm chapter 16. If you've been doing the reading along with the church you and you're up to date, then you would have been reading this on Monday morning. Uh, it's one of my favorite passages uh, in all of Scripture. It's just a wonderful reminder that I go back to regularly. Because what we're going to see is a godly response to trouble. A godly response to trouble. And you might be thinking in your life, oh, I'm not going through too much trouble right now. Life's pretty good. And some of you might be in here and thinking, that's exactly what I need to hear. And if we're honest, we all face troubles every single day. We are in a broken world, whether it's a big trouble or small trouble, we face the troubles of this world every single day. We face a sinful interaction with somebody. We face losing a loved one. We face all these things that are just signs of a broken world. And it brings trouble in our lives. And we're going to look at how David responds to this time of trouble. And I said this last time when I preached uh, the Psalms, but it's a good reminder. I, I love the book of Psalms because it's so unique in the fact that It's like we're reading a personal journal. All the other letters or anything else we read, we see Paul writing to these people to tell them what to do. Or we see Luke writing a narrative. Or we see Moses writing a narrative. It's a lot less personal saying what they are personally going through. The writer or the author is personally going through. But we see that in the Psalms. And we're going to see what David is going through through this Psalm. So... I'm going to read for us out of Psalm 16. We'll go ahead and read the first, we'll just read the first two verses. Psalm 16, a mitcom of David. Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have nothing good besides you. Let me pray for us. Father, you are so good. Your word reveals the truth to us, and I pray that we would open our our hearts to your word. No matter what language we use, we cannot accurately describe how good you are, but I pray that we just get a glimpse tonight that we would fall more in love with you and how great you are and remember how to respond in times of trouble. Because we're all facing troubles. And... I really believe in some way, shape, or form, we need to be responding like David does through all of our troubles. I pray that we can learn from David's example, but also that you would work in our hearts to just show us how great you are. I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So, as we look at the book of Psalms, Psalms is, really, it was used and a lot of context and originally used as like a hymn book. And the early church and especially the, in the Old Testament, the Jews would go through these things and actually sing these psalms, which you might try to sing some of these psalms now and be like, I don't know, none of this stuff rhymes. This doesn't make any sense. One, that is a translation issue. Some of them actually do have some rhythm and rhyme to them. And some of them just sometimes you don't have to rhyme in a psalm. They had a different culture, different ways of doing things. And I actually love uh, that there's been a kind of resurgence in more and more artists seeing the need to sing the Psalms. There have been more and more artists that have come out with just basically putting these uh, Psalms into, sometimes it's exactly what you read in Scripture. Sometimes they just take a portion of it and say, okay, we're going to make this still appealing, but the same truth of that Psalm is going to be saying. But Really, you see all throughout Psalms, because of that idea, a big theme throughout Psalms is praise. Makes sense. Like that's what we're supposed to be doing. And every single one of our points that we're going to look at today is going to look at how we praise God in our troubles. Praise God in our troubles. And I'll go ahead and tell you, like, that is what God wants us to do in our troubles. That is the purpose that God made us is to praise him. So it makes sense that even when we are in trouble, we praise Him. 
But there are some practical facts that we're even going to see of why it's good to praise God in our troubles. So every single point that we're going to look at tonight is going to be about praising God in our troubles. So I'll read for us again. Verse 1, it says, Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. So we don't know exactly what was going on with, these, uh, with David in this psalm. Sometimes we can read a psalm and look down and you actually notice like this says, a mitkem of David. That's uh, just to let you all know, in the psalms, they're a little bit uniquely formatted. That's actually in the scripture when it says a mitkem of David, when it's it, people, uh, different Bibles format it different ways. Mine says confidence in the Lord above it. That's uh, that bold thing above it. That's probably uh, that's probably added on by translators just for you to know what's going on. But the part that says a mitkem of David or even if, uh, if you look at chapter 17, it says a prayer of David. Chapter 18, it says, For the choir director of the servants of the Lord, David, who spoke these words in the song to the Lord on the day that the Lord rescued him from the grasp of all of his enemies and from the power of Saul, he said. So you see, these are actually introductions. They're inspired words of Scripture. And we don't have, just like we saw in uh, chapter 18, that was a pretty descriptive of exactly when this happened. Psalm 16 doesn't have that. But a lot of people assume that the situation that David was in, that he was obviously worried for his life. And we see that in verse 1 that we see right here. It says, protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. A lot of people assume it's probably during the time of life that, that Saul was after him. That Saul was trying to take his life and he was calling out to God saying, protect me, God. I need protection. Somebody is actually the king of Israel is out to kill me. So obviously he's in pretty bad trouble. I can't, I'm, I'm assuming most of our, uh, most of the people here tonight in the congregation are not, do not have somebody actively seeking to kill them. But we do have problems. We do have troubles. We do have things that we need to deal with. And we're going to see how he responds to this trouble, that his life is in trouble. He says, Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. The first thing that he does is, our first point is, praise God for who he is. So the first thing that David does in his prayer, after calling out to God for protection, he praises God for who he is. He says, verse 2, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have nothing good besides you. Notice the, it says, if uh, if you're looking in your Bible, it says, I said to the Lord, if you see an all caps Lord in your Bible, that's, uh, that typically means that it's talking about the divine name of God. What we would translate Yahweh, we don't know exactly what uh, it translates to. But he says, I said to Yahweh, you are my Lord. Notice that's not full caps. So he's saying he's actually in this position. You are my Lord and I have nothing good besides you. So he starts praising how good God is. When he is worried for his life, he starts talking about how good God is. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that's usually not my first reaction when I go through trouble. It might be, you might be somebody that reacts in a way that says, why did God let this happen to me? Sometimes you might not even be thinking about God at all. You're just thinking about, why is this person doing this to me? You're not thinking about God at all. You're just thinking about how much you're angry at the person for trying to kill you or scared of the person, you, you're not focused on praising the Lord, but that's his first response. It says, you are my Lord. I have nothing good besides you. And he emphasizes that point even more in verse three. He says, as for the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones. All my delight is in them. Now that sounds like a little bit of a contradiction, doesn't it? He said, God, you're the only thing good that I have. Then he says, the holy people in the land, all my delights in them. So which is it, David? Like, is it, is it really, is it really God or is it your godly friends that you're around? And I'll tell you, that's not a contradiction because what he is saying is the only place that I can find joy in this world is when I interact with people that have been so impacted by God that they look like God. Have you ever met somebody like that? Do you have a friend like that that shows you the love of Jesus in that way? 
that even if you aren't reading your Bible, that they come and reach out to you and it's like, man, they really pointed me to Jesus. If you don't, you need to find someone like that. And you also need to ask yourself the question, am I that person for someone else? He says, God is so, so good. He's the only good thing that I have. And he's so good that the only good thing that I can find in this world are the people that know him. Those are the only good ones that I can find. That's the only place that I can find joy. Every time I talk to these unbelievers, I just see how depraved they are. I see how much their worldview just makes no sense and how it's sad. It just depresses me to see the way that they think about the world and how they think these things are okay. I'm sure we all have had those types of uh, moments as believers where you just talk to somebody and you're like, man, I really care about you, but it's sad hearing you talk about what you love. He says the holy people are the ones uh, that he finds all his delight because God is so good. He is God is rubbing off. That's what that's what it means to be sanctified is to become more and more like God, to be holy. So he says these holy people are the only ones that I can find joy in. He goes on to say the sorrows of those who take another God for themselves will multiply. I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood and I will not speak their names with my lips. Again, this is probably not a very common response for a lot of people. We all know people, you might be one of these people, we've all had these moments when you get angry or you're scared, you go through trouble in life, you might lash out. You might do something that you shouldn't have done. You might say something that you shouldn't have said. And so many times, How many times have we done something that we weren't supposed to do and somebody confronts us about it and we just automatically respond, well, so-and-so did this to me. We start listing off our troubles and why we it was okay for us to do this. Because that's our first response, right? We, We lash out. Our first response usually isn't to go and be more like Jesus. It's usually to do something unholy. And there's also so many people that have been burnt by the church that end up when that, when that moment happens, they end up just completely writing off the uh, church, writing off Christianity completely, and they go chase after the exact opposite. That's a natural thing for people to do. And especially that response, that's a natural thing for the natural man, an unsaved person to do. I'm not saying if you've left the church and you're backsliding that you're not a believer, but that is a typical response of an unbeliever to run in the exact opposite way of God. If you do that for years and years and years, I have very good reason to doubt that you were ever truly saved in the first place. But he says the sorrows of those who take another God will mul- for themselves will multiply. So there's a lot of things in the world that this world props up and says, this is good. This is what you should seek after. But what we see here is if you seek after those things, you're just going to become more sad. There are so many people that have bowed down to the almighty dollar. And there's so many rich people that will tell you that's not what gives you happiness. Sure, every single one of us could probably look, oh, it'd be nice to have a little bit extra money for this be nice to have a little bit extra money for that. I wouldn't have to worry about that. But it never satisfies. It never satisfies. It's just going to multiply your sorrows. Whatever you chase after that is not God is going to multiply sorrows. And David understands that and says, I'm not going to respond to my troubles by running off into sin. But I'm going to respond by praising God. And he also says, I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood and I will not speak their names with my lips. Which sounds a little bit weird to me. It's like, okay, well, at least we're not struggling with that. We're not pouring blood offerings out. Like that just just sounds weird. Like, okay, we're at least doing better. And apparently some people around him were doing. Apparently they were pouring out these drink offerings of blood in response to trouble. But we do the exact same thing. It may not look like that but we chase after other gods. When we go through troubles, a lot of times we go back to that idol that we have. 
We go back to that thing that might try to bring us satisfaction. You might go, if, if you've had a problem with drinking in the past, you might be tempted to go back to drinking. If you had a problem with drugs in the past, you might be tempted to go back to drugs when you go through times of trouble. You might have a problem whenever you go through, uh, go through these problems, you might binge eat, eat way too much. When you go through troubles, you might end up looking at pornography. There's so many different sins that we can chase after when we go through these problems. And he says, I'm not chasing after those things. I'm not participating in any of it. And matter of fact, he says, I will not speak their names with my lips. I'm not even going to talk about it. I'm not even going to entertain the idea. I'm not even going to joke about it. Not, it's not going to come off my lips. It's not even a thought to me. I'm going to throw that thought out. He ran from sin in this time. Then he goes on to say, Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. And when he's talking about portion here, I truly believe he's, he's got this idea of like your daily portions, what you would eat. Like, and there's, there's plenty of places that you can go. I'm, man, nothing, nothing frustrates me more than going to a fancy restaurant that you can get excited about. Okay, we're going to sit down at a fancy restaurant and then they give you little bitty portions. You, leave, you spent more than you would spend 10 times at any fast food place and leave hungry. But he says, you are my portion. You are exactly what I need to get through the day. You are exactly what I need. And a lot of us do not act that way. A lot of us, when we go through problems, we don't go run to God and say, that's what's going to satisfy me. We know the truth that, oh yeah, God is supposed to satisfy me, but I think a lot of us don't really believe it. When we go through those times of trouble, you might have that thought, what if, I, what if I went and read my Bible right now? What if I took this to God in prayer? What if I stepped away and did this? And then you're thinking, well, I know I'm in the middle of this Old Testament story that I'm not really interested in. I know you start thinking, that's not going to do it for me. You start thinking, God's not going to satisfy me. But you go back to the thing that you already know has left you empty over and over and over again. But that is not the case with the Lord. He is our portion and our cup of blessing. We can be satisfied in the Lord no matter what you are going through. No matter what we go through, we can be satisfied and filled up. So we praise God for who He is because that's who He is. Going through some of the things that He says about the Lord here, He says, he, first of all, He is my Lord. He's the boss. That's, that's one of the reasons that I made the difference between Him using the divine name of Yahweh and Lord. He says, Yahweh, you're my Lord. You're in charge. You are, you are the boss of my life. So it doesn't matter what I want to do. It matters what you want me to do. That's the first thing that he says. Then he goes on and talks about how I have no good besides you. He calls God so good. And then he says, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. He is satisfying for us. Do you feel discontent? The reason that you crave so much more stuff, the reason that you crave more money, the, the reason you crave more acceptance, the reason you crave more popularity, the reason you crave more anything is because you're unsatisfied. But I'm telling you, the Lord is good and filling. He can satisfy you you got to get into his word and, and realize who he is. See who he is. You might say, oh, I already know who he is. I can list off some facts about him. It's just different. It's different than even just, just think about when any person that you know, if you read off a biography about them, it would not be 
it wouldn't mean as much to you, would it? Like reading off a biography, you can do a little bit of something. You can list off some facts about this person. But thinking about those personal memories you have with them just stirs up your heart, doesn't it? Remembering your testimony, how God saved you. Looking at how God saved others. Not just listing off facts about Him, but really looking at who He is and how great He is can change your heart, can be satisfying. And the next thing he does is he ends up praising God for what he's doing. Praising God for what he's doing. So he prays God for who he is, and then he ends up praising God for what he is currently doing, what he is doing right now. I'll start back in verse 5. It says, you are, Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. The, line, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. It says, I will bless the Lord who counsels me even at night when my thoughts trouble me. I will always let the Lord guide me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. So he says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. And I think... We could look at each one of these things and be like, okay, what is he talking about? What does it mean the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places? Because that can mean a bunch of different things. Like you don't know exactly what he's getting at. But when he follows it up with, indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. What I think he is talking about right there is God has bound him for heaven. As he's looking and reflecting on his life and how he might die, he also remembers I have a beautiful inheritance waiting on me. Whether I live through this or not, I have a beautiful inheritance waiting on me. You know what? If God wants me to die, <laughs> to live is Christ and to die is gain. It is gain. And he says the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. It means we are bound for heaven. I think this really is nodding at the fact that as a believer, if you are a true believer in Christ, your place in heaven is bound. You can't lose your salvation. It is bound. God has a place in heaven waiting for you, and there's nothing you can do to disqualify that because there was nothing you did to qualify yourself for that spot in heaven. He says, I know where I'm going, so death is no longer scary. I am facing death, but I know where I'm going. The worst thing you can do to me is send me to the best place that I could ever go. He says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. And I truly believe this is, I said, praise God for what he is currently doing because I do believe this is something God is actively doing in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. He is keeping us in the faith. You see all these people that end up Fall, uh, falling away from the faith and they were seem like devoted Christians early on in their life and then they end up leaving. But God has made a promise that we are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He is actively working in our life to give us faith every single day. Because if it was left up to us to keep our own faith, we would lose it. We would be running the exact opposite way. Every bit of our salvation is all glory to God. He is keeping us saved. Then he says, I will bless the Lord who counsels me even at night when my thoughts trouble me. Have you ever had those moments in, at night when you just can't go to sleep? Whether it be you get into bed at night and you can't go to sleep or you wake up in the middle of the night, you had a bad dream, you wake up and you're wide awake, and your thoughts just start rolling. I, I can tell you, this is, I'm, I'm one of the worst at it. I'm, I constantly start thinking about, this is something I need to do. This is something I need to do. What, how can I make this better? Or even thinking about stupid stuff, like it's nothing important. Like my mind just races and I can't calm down at times. But one of those things I can tell from personal experience, one of the worst things about that is, Everyone's asleep. No one's around to tell your worries to. No one's around to hear you out, to make you feel like you're not alone. Even though people are right there, everybody's asleep. You feel alone. 
It's like, I'm not going to wake somebody up. I'm not going to do this over something stupid. But you do have somebody. You are never alone. He says, I will bless the Lord who counsels me even at night when my thoughts trouble me. You can respond to those troubling thoughts, those racing thoughts and say, I'm going to take it all to the Lord. And some of you might say, well, I've done that. And then I end up worrying the rest of the night anyway. One, that doesn't promise you that you're going to get a good night's sleep. We're still sinful human beings and we are not perfect. But also, it might be the fact that you're lifting up those prayers to God almost as a superstitious, oh, if I just do this, he's going to make me okay. You're not actually trusting God with what you're worrying about. He is there to counsel you and remind you of God's word. That's the blessing of the Holy Spirit that we have. We have the Holy Spirit, the counselor who lives inside of our heart that will never leave us. This is what he's doing right now in our lives. He says, I always let the Lord guide me because he is my right hand. I will not be shaken. Now notice the difference between verse 1 and verse 8. And this is where I see the most practical thing about why we should go to God and praise Him in our troubles. Because notice he started out saying, protect me, God. Now he's saying, verse 8, I will not be shaken. I'm no longer screaming and begging for help. He says, I'm not going to be shaken. I am firm where I am at. I am good. In just eight verses, he goes from protect me, God, to God's got me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And that's the power of praising God in our troubles. Because when he actually started to step back and say, okay, my problem, my problem is that I'm worried about my life. Well, look at how good God is. Look at what he's doing in my life. And then suddenly he said, God is so much bigger than my problem. And God loves me. God cares about me. He is actively, he, he loves me enough that he is actively involved in my life, that he can counsel me at night when my heart troubles me. Whatever you go through, God is loving you, caring about you, working in your life. What do I have to worry about? His whole attitude changed. He says, I will not be shaken. He goes on to say, Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My body also rests securely. For you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy and at your right hand are eternal pleasures. So he says, in light of this, I'm glad. Even though I am worried for my life, I'm glad. Because my, he says, my body also rests securely, for you will not abandon me to Sheol. And if you don't know what Sheol is, there's a bunch of different opinions, but in the very simple form, it's the place of the dead. It's where you go when you die. Some people just translate it as the grave. So you're not going to abandon me to the grave. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me in your presence is abundant joy and at your right hand are eternal pleasures. He knows, yeah, I might die, but I'm not staying in the grave. I'm not staying in the grave. What I have waiting on me, he says, I'm going to go be in God's presence. This great, good God. I'm going to go be in his presence. And he says, in your presence is abundant joy, and at your right hand are eternal pleasures. We have that waiting on us as believers. No matter what you go through, they cannot take that from you. You have eternal pleasures waiting on you and abundant joy. And the good news is, just like I said before, God's presence, the Holy Spirit, lives inside of you. That doesn't mean as a Christian you're always going to be happy, but it does mean you have access to that joy at any time. You have access to the joy that says there at your, uh, in your presence is an abundant joy or fullness of joy that e, uh, ESV would say. In your presence is abundant joy. So if you struggle with depression, 
Remember, you've got the presence of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And you can have joy. You have joy waiting on you. Just seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Stop seeking after the things of this world. You can have joy. And when we get into heaven, we're going to have eternal pleasures with Him forever. There's one more thing I want to look at with this passage, but we're actually going to have to flip over to Acts 2. Because if you did not know, in the very uh, famous moment of Pentecost, we have a sermon from Peter that he actually quotes this passage and has something else to say about it. So in Acts 2, if you want to flip over there with me, you can. This is an awesome passage. This is such a good sermon. Uh, We have uh, Peter preaching at Pentecost, and we won't be able to get into the whole sermon, everything that he said, but we're going to start in verse 22. So Acts 2, 22. It says, Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me, Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh rests in hope because you will not abandon me in Hades or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. So he's preaching this sermon, talks about the resurrection of Jesus, quotes uh, quotes the passage that we've been reading in Psalm 16, at least the end of it. And he says, Verse 29, brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. God God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So he makes a point about this passage and he says, Something's not lining up about this passage. You said you weren't going to abandon David. David said you're not going to abandon me to the grave. But we have his grave right here. I mean, he might, he might not still be there at this point after all of his bones have gone away, but we haven't seen him resurrected. What was being talked about here in Psalm 16, he said David knew he would have a descendant coming from him. He knew he would have a descendant coming from him that would be resurrected. That's what his interpretation, that's what he says this passage is about. He says, God raised this Jesus and we are all witnesses of this. So he says, when he says, you will not abandon me to Hades or to Sheol, he was talking about Jesus because he was not abandoned in the grave. He came out three days later. And This is not to say that Psalm 16 is not an encouragement for us and not applied to us because because of what Jesus did and because He is resurrected from the dead, that is also true of us. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. He's the first resurrected body that we get to follow in His likeness when He comes back. Sure, you might know plenty of believers that are still in their grave at this at this point. At least their body is still in this grave. But when Jesus comes back, they're going to be resurrected just like Jesus was. They're going to have a new body, a new life, and we are all going to be on the new heavens and new earth together. And that's because of what Jesus did. It is true of David that he's not going to be abandoned to the grave because Jesus was not abandoned to the grave. Now, if we're going to worry about dying, 
Death is nothing to God. He is so much more powerful than death. Not to say that death isn't a big deal. Or God's just a big deal. An even bigger deal. He is so much more powerful than death. And I want to uh, reread what uh, Peter said in verse 24 because it's such a good verse. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. It was not possible for Jesus to be held by death. Because He is more powerful than death. He is the God of life. And even if you are living a life of death, living a life that's opposed to Him, even if every single one of these responses of David in Psalm 16 looks so foreign to you that you're, you might be thinking, am I truly even a believer? I, I, in no way would I respond that way. Your first response might be, God, why did you do this? And you you might be in a season of your life that you're angry with God. You don't even know why you're at church tonight. God is good and He is working in your circumstances. He has proven to be good over and over and over again. And this, I, I, I think I skipped over telling you what this last point is, but praise God for what He has done. That's what we're talking about here is praising God for what he has done. So our three points are praise God for who he is, what he's doing, and what he's done. So if you are going through trouble, look at how good God is and say, you know what? He's the one in in charge. and I think I trust him. You should trust him. He's the one who created everything for a purpose. He knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly why you're going through that trouble. And then we also need to look and praise God for what he's currently doing in our lives. Start looking around. And that's that's one of the great things about Thanksgiving is that we end up having these times where we look back and say, man, God has given me a good family. God has given me this. God has given me that. We need to be doing that every single day. Because I know a lot of us, including myself, we can get ourselves into a bad mood thinking, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Look at what God is doing in your life. And also remember what God has done. And this is a whole book of what God has done and what He's going to do. And He has proven Himself over and over again on, by what He's done so we can know He's going to do what He said He was going to do. He's going to come back. We're going to be resurrected like Jesus if you have truly trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, I know we're on, uh, here on a Wednesday night. You especially assume on a Wednesday night, oh, everybody, somebody who come here on a Wednesday night must be a believer. That is not the assumption that we should ever have. You know, there's people that are devoted to a false god that go to church and read their, uh, read their false scriptures every single day. Just because somebody is devoted to something does not mean that they have truly trusted in the Lord. I want to challenge you and think about it. Have you truly given everything over to the Lord? Or are you just kind of following these steps to hope that you can go to heaven one day? Or you've gone through a real tough time, so you started reading your Bible and praying more, hoping that God would bless you and get you out of these troubles. That's not how God works. God is not just up up in... uh, up in heaven looking down and just waiting for us to give Him a list of things to do so He can make our lives better. When you start realizing life, your life is about God, not God's life isn't about you. You start to realize what Christianity truly is. And even though it is all about God, God still cared enough about us to send His Son to die for us. It still could have all been about God and every single one of us gone to hell. And he would have been just. Never sent his son and said, I'm going to set up the system. You work your way to heaven. That's not what he did. He said, I am so holy, you'll never reach me. But I am going to come down and reach out to you. I'm going to send my son to live the life that you couldn't live, die the death that you deserve, and be resurrected so you can be resurrected and live a holy life. 
and live forever in his presence where there is fullness or abundance of joy. And at his right hand, there are eternal pleasures. You could have that assurance tonight. So I encourage you, even on a Wednesday night, somebody can be saved. And trust me, no one is going to look down on you for you having questions about your salvation. That is the most important thing that you can nail down. Doesn't matter if you've been in this church for years. Doesn't matter if you've been a deacon at this church. Doesn't matter if you've been a Sunday school teacher. That doesn't mean that you're saved. What means the only thing that can save you is by truly trusting in the Lord as your Lord and Savior. Trusting Jesus for what He did, not the works that you do. I encourage y'all, if you have a problem, if you're worrying about something right now, respond to God the way that David did. You can use the altar and come down and praise God. You can use the time of worship. You don't have to come down here. You can just use the time of worship as we have our last song. I'm just going to praise God with my whole heart and think about how God has blessed me. I want to challenge you. Don't just leave and say, okay, we heard, we heard from the Lord and He's going to change my life. No, you need to do something. You need to respond. If you're not saved, come talk to somebody. Figure out how you can nail down that salvation tonight. If you are saved and you're struggling through sin, deal with that tonight. Don't just say, oh, I'm going to deal with that at some point. Deal with it now. Trust in the Lord. Praise Him through your storms because He is trustworthy and faithful. I'll pray for us and we can go into a time of invitation. Father, I thank You for who You are. I thank You that You are so good. You are bigger than our circumstances, God. I pray that You would work in each one of our hearts, that You would show us where we're not trusting in You, Lord. You would show us where we really aren't believing what Your Word says. You would show us where when we face troubles that we're responding in a negative way. None of us are, none of us are perfect, but we also don't need to just lay aside our uh, look at our sin and say it's not a big deal because everybody does it. If we truly love You, we will desire to keep Your commandments. Not to be saved, but just to please You because we know You're perfect and holy and we know that it is good. I pray that You would work all of this in our hearts, that we would have confidence and boldness no matter what troubles we face, whether we have somebody in here facing terminal cancer, whether we have somebody uh, struggling with personal sin, whether we have somebody struggling with losing a loved one, whatever it may be, Lord, all those troubles can be taken to You. And we just need to remember how good You are, how perfect You are, and trust You through all of it. I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.